My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. My name is Jeffrey Ken, and welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. And I'm joined today by Dave Shook, who is the CEO and co-founder of Shook IoT. Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, and so you and I met. Uh, I'm trying to remember when, Dave. It was uh, was it probably was at a uh, one of the many conferences that I attend in at the context of digital and oil and gas. Yes, um, I'll be honest. I'm pretty sure it was in Calgary, but more than that, I honestly can't <laughs> remember the details. <laughs> so, tell tell me a little bit about your background, Dave. I remember you. You, I know you're a, a well educated lad, but um, give us give us the, the backstory. Yeah, so um, I have a I'm a chemical engineer originally. Um, PhD, bachelor's and PhD in chemical engineering. Uh, I've worked in industry primarily based in Alberta since 1991, started out as an advanced control engineer, went into plant technical supervision, then transitioned into the oh consulting and technology development world. And I've been there pretty much ever since, uh, mm. working with uh, oil and gas, uh, basically throughout the process industries for yeah. the last almost thirty years. There's ample uh, ample infrastructure and process and process control in Alberta. If, oh, if, yeah. you, if you want to build a career in that sort of thing, you can't beat you can't beat this province. When well, was the best place to do to go to school for it too? Uh, University of Alberta was at the time and still is at the forefront of that area of research and and postgraduate education. Yeah, I think that that point's lost actually on on many people. It, it, the uh, I like to remind people, you know, there is an ecosystem that that nurtures and feeds the demand in the community for talent, and the universities play a pivotal role. University of Alberta, oh, yeah. in particular, yeah, exactly. So, tell us a little bit about uh, Shook IoT. Uh, you know, what's what what, uh, what what's the company all about, and and what do you do there? Aside from okay. being the CEO and <laughs> telling <laughs> telling the I troops, what, telling what the troops, what, yeah, what do you do? I mean, what does the company do? What what uh, what what what's the area of business that you're in? Sure. So, um, notwithstanding the IoT, uh, we don't manufacture hardware devices. Um, what happened is, was uh, I had in my latest career started up uh, an automation engineering consulting firm, and I was doing some consulting for an, uh, a large oil and gas company uh, in their central analytics group. And the term industrial internet of things came up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting. As it, as it would, looking yeah. at, mm -hmm. I beg your pardon? I say as it would these days. As it, as it would, right? Mm -hmm. This is about four years ago. And so I looked at it and the, the first thought I had was, well, this is just what we in automation uh, have been doing for the past 30 years. Um, but it's now being uh, broadly applied beyond the process industries. So a lot of companies that have not yet had this had this industrial information management problem that the process industries have been dealing with are, are going to have to deal with this problem. Oh. Uh, and the other side, flip side of that is that the industrial automation vendors in the process industries no longer have a lock on their customers. Ah. Right. So because the big players like Microsoft, with whom we work directly, and Google and AWS are really breaking down the wall that the automation vendors were able to erect around their ecosystem. Uh, so However, they can't do it by themselves. And this was where the, the idea for Shook IoT came in. Uh, a, good, a, ma a man who's now a good friend of mine showed me the Microsoft Internet of Things software suite. And I said to him, you know, there's a missing piece, right? Uh, and he, he understood what I was talking about. And I said, you know, is Microsoft looking to, to build that? And he said, I don't know. And about six months later, he got a hold of me when he was in Redmond. We talked to a product manager and they said, yeah, we consider that domain content. We're not going to build that. So we created Shook IoT more or less on the spot 
and we call ourselves the missing piece in the industrial Internet of Things. And without so, belaboring the point, yeah. in the process industries, you don't have discrete equipment that's each each piece of which is doing a standalone job. What you have is a manufacturing process, and the equipment collaborates in executing that process. And you need to model not just the equipment but the process. Um, and that exists in other manufacturing industries, but it is at its most complex as an information management problem in the in process the industries, yeah. Yeah. right? of which oil and gas is one example. So mm. we took that and ran with it, and now we've got you know our core component, which is this information model system, and we've built around that um, a cloud-based thing called a, a historian, which is a type of software that's existed in the process industries. Mm -hmm. But we can now offer a shrink wrap solution that goes head to head with much larger companies than ours who are, you know, in expensive incumbents in the process industries. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And what does the, I mean, just in terms of the business problem, I mean, I, I if I think about it as, uh, imagine, a, you know, a process and world, a control room, say, controlling a refinery or a gas plant, right. uh, I'll have, say, I've got uh, 12 units that are all, you know, either uh, drying my gas or removing uh, impurities. And so each of these has a control panel that's con uh, providing uh, instrumentation back to the control room around what that unit is doing. Uh, right. and there will be a control board that will show uh, broadly the process from one end to the other. And what I think what you're saying here is, is that, um, well, the industrial Internet of Things world will give you a sensor and uh, a visibility to the unit uh, where that sensor is installed. It won't show you the full context. In, as I've got that right, and that's why why a Microsoft would say, well, we, we're not in the business of process modeling for oil and gas. We, we just sell this piece of kit. So it's not, it's right. not going to get built by us. If you want to build it, go for it. Right. So, yeah. So the, with, in the, in the internet of things world that Microsoft serves really well, you have discrete objects and devices that they call them yeah. nest thermostats, uh, video doorbells, that kind of thing. Yep. Each one of which talks directly over, you know, the cloud over the internet to a server somewhere. Mm. Um, now, in the industrial Internet of Things, those devices, first of all, as you point out, there's a local control system. So on site in a gas plant or an oil refinery, you've got separation, you've got gas purification, you've got separation processes. Mm. And those are controlled by you know, control systems, PLCs, distributed control systems, that kind of thing on site. Mm. And, and that's taking care of the second-to-second decision-making processes. And there's an operator historically been located at site, more and more that they're being a centralized function. So yeah. for smaller facilities, they're now working in in head office remotely. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Remote. And, 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 and so you've got this central – you have this control system that's ganging together data from a bunch of equipment. When you then – want to perform analytics against that data, the, the central problem is that the information about the process that is flowing through that equipment, as well as the relationships that the various sort of sensors and actuators, valves, motors, whatever, the relationships among them are, are kind of encoded implicitly in the control system or in people's heads. Mm. They're not those relationships are not captured in any sort of software environment, which is fine inside the plant because everybody inside the plant actually knows what that valve's job is, what this measurement's job is. But once you get out outside the plant and you're dealing with analytics and you want to look at, say, the performance of every compressor in the enterprise or the, you know, the condition of the heat exchangers, you now need the analytics to engage with those as objects that have certain properties. And uh, that kind of information modeling is, is generally not done at the plant level, and the tools to do it uh, are inflexible and difficult to use. And Microsoft basically missed that 
context modeling piece for the process industries in their IoT solution, um, as well as the data acquisition from the control system, uh, if they, they missed that as well. So what we've been able to do is come up with something that can do you know, robust, secure, centrally managed acquisition out of those control systems through the intervening firewalls mm. up to the cloud and then organize that data not as a bunch of arcane Discrete. You know, tag yeah. names, yeah, exactly. right? yeah. but, but in terms of their physical meaning. So it's you know, suction pressure on the first inlet compressor in such and such gas plant. Yeah. Which, which makes it possible for you to build analytics off of it. And or create, if you like, a, f a, a really thoughtful and fully featured digital version of the plant. Correct. Uh, that you yeah. can then, so at, at the plant level, typical plant operations don't, don't concern themselves with, say, the input cost of power to run a specific uh, plant feature or to run the plant. Uh, and as a consequence, plants just generally run to heat, hit a reliability target or an availability target, a quality target, but not an economic target. That's and, right. And even if they do, what they'll do is they'll bring in the cost of power and the operator will have that as sort of an advisory piece of information yeah. on, a, on a screen somewhere. And that'll be a secondary consideration because their first consideration is keep production keep up, production keep safety. Up. Precisely. Right. Yeah. Yep, exactly right. Very. So this is a, really interesting to, to think that the, um, the, 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 the uh, think of it as the hole in the landscape. But without this, a uh, bunch of the higher ordered um, uh, analytics, digital modeling tools, uh, future controlling and you know, because where this digital twin takes us is to a, a more robotic uh, control world where yeah. a machine can start to assume more responsibility for the execution of a, of a process, not just a responsibility for a specific uh, module in a process. I can kind of look oh. at the overall process. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first area where people tend to go is they go to, well, let's, let's use this as a monitoring tool for you know, performance of uh, assets, and then let's look at the condition of the assets. And then the next interesting piece becomes optimization of the value delivered by the asset subject to its current condition. And, and I'll give you, you know, an, a real life example of that. Mm. Um, I, I have, my wife and I have a couple of different vehicles. Uh, her vehicle that she drives every day is a Subaru Forester SUV with really good winter tires. My daily driver, yeah, it's a little red sports car. So uh, when the roads are bad, uh, I have to drive my car much more carefully than she needs to drive her Forester mm. because of the you know operational context. Yeah, when roads are bare and dry, I have a lot more fun in my car. But the operating context you know, really determines how you should be operating the equipment. And, and that's a piece where everybody's generally doing their best, but often they don't have the right information necessary to make the decision or it's not contextualized properly. And they, so the prize, if I were, if I were, had a process environment was investigating the, the potential use of newer, these newer, newer devices, uh, the, I'd either have to build this integration environment or this layer, uh, independently, um, or I will do without, or I will sort of cobble it together with, um, mm -hmm. Excel spreadsheets, or I'll just put up with after the fact analysis. I won't have really good yeah, in the moment or dynamic analysis. And yeah. what you're doing is you're solving for that 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 problem or that gap in this in this architectural structure. That's right. Yeah. And and this is the result really of um, in about two thousand, uh, we built a an analytic application at my former employer at the time. Uh, and uh, it didn't have anything like this. So huh. what happened was we, we had a whole bunch of results that were devoid of context. Yeah. 
Uh, so now what? Right. So the, the next step became, you know, well, then what happened was we had changes. Like people would add an asset to be managed and, oh, crap, now we have to add it by hand. Or they would make a change in a configuration setting and we'd have to reach down into the application to make that change. And what we're finding is that anybody can pilot an application without this kind of uh, context model, information model, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Digital twin scaffold is the yeah. term that we, that we like to use. Yep. Right. You can build a one-off. The problem is that the long-term cost of ownership is enormous with those one-offs. And so people, first they build a one-off with things hard-coded in, and then they go, right, let's roll this out. And then there's a very awkward silence as they try and take this thing that's been hard-coded and go, oh, crap, well, we built a bunch of rules in here as for what the data streams were called for this equipment. Okay. Well, now we can build a lookup table. Great. But now we've got the fact that there's actually two or three subtly different types of equipment doing the same job. And sometimes we want to look at them for their job. And sometimes we, yeah. have, we want to look at how they're internally constructed. And you get into this can of worms that very quickly kills project rollouts if you're not really, really careful. And so what, what uh, I mean, you know, I've got customers, obviously. What, what, what's yeah. been their feedback? What, what, what results have, have they relayed to you as to uh, the impact that thinking architecturally uh, in a different way ha has yielded to, to them by way of benefits? Well, it's, uh, the funniest one was we did a pilot with a particular company and it was really just intended to show the value of bringing the data from their on-premise uh, information system up into the cloud and, and organize it. And um, it was we. It was the objective was to build a single display using Microsoft Power BI that gave them an overview of their process. And uh, by the time we ended that proof of value project, uh, the demand for that particular display was so great that the project kind of sneaked out into production and they now have executives looking at that thing as it updates, which is a little scary from a project implementation point of view <laughs> because they're running on a, you know, they're running on a dev server. Yeah. They don't have the change management or support processes in place. But, you know, it's a pretty clear, you know, description of the value of, of the approach. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that, you know, yep. that, that was the big one. So, yeah, we're seeing and as customers go to more applications, uh, you can present just about anything in a web page mm. uh, without having to do a lot of this. But once you start building calculations, people start going, oh, I understand why you want this. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's it's to a considerable extent, it's a, you know, they take it on faith that it's useful. And then once they start rolling out the, the production stuff, it's like, oh, now this is what's saving us money at this point. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's what what uh, software developers call a, a Nicky Wizzy problem. I'll know it when I see it. And, and right. it's not until they see it to the kind of the, the light switch go on. So all the Arm waving, yeah. all the arm waving you can do in the world. And it's not until uh, that dashboard shows up at the executive's desk where they kind of go, aha, this is, the, yeah. this is the prize. And so that's right. Have you been dealing with it? I mean, it sounds like the, the, the reaction's positive. Are you encountering resistance uh, to adoption? And if so, where, where does it sit? Is it, uh, is it, is it just the incumbent Excel modeling and, and Excel ownership that uh, throw up objections to, to change? There's a few, there's a few, few legitimate ones, I would say. Hmm. So um, first of all, um, there are legitimate security and reliability concerns that people in the plant have about uh, safely getting data from the plant up to the cloud without placing their operational systems at risk. Yeah, cyber risk. So that's a, yeah. But yeah. yeah, and and 
um, like the first time I crashed an operational database server was in 1992, right? And you can do it and it causes problems, right? So people are are, are very sensitive to, to avoiding the overloading of the operational systems. Um, so that's a totally reasonable concern. And it's uh, frankly an education thing. Um, then there are certain types of data that uh, it's not always uh, cost effective to bring up to the cloud in its raw state. Uh, and a great example of this it's a volume, is a like, volume question, I assume. That's right. The volume data. question. Yeah. It, vibration data, uh. right? Don't send up the millisecond values, send up the, the Fourier transform signatures. Yeah. Right. Classic yep. one. Right. Yep. yep. So so there are there are some pretty reasonable things there. Um, there are also uh, uh, we've bumped into uh, people who have, let's say, oh, I could do that myself. Uh, and we bumped into that yeah, a lots few of that. times. Yeah, yeah there's, right. lot, there's actually lots of that in the in the a lot of entrepreneurs complain about that is that they uh, once once the op operations uh, uh, head office, so anyone, literally anyone in oil and gas with a, a strong industrial and engineering background realizes what it is. They, they it's you get to the you, you quickly think, oh, I could do that. I, I don't need to sure. buy that. Sure. Sure yeah. you could. Sure you could. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. But, um, you know, we'll see you in six months when you haven't, yeah. right? Or, <laughs> or when you did it yourself and now the cost of ownership because you didn't think through all the exceptions uh, is getting you. Yeah. But, you know, so that's just a, yeah, not ready. Yep. Um, there are, within oil and gas, uh, we've had really good traction. There's a couple of other industries where uh, they're not ready. So we're not pushing a rope there. Hmm. Um, yeah, so... We, I, normally, I normally see oil and gas as one of the slowest to adopt uh, these sorts of things for, for the reasons mm -hmm. we sketched out. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, the plants run 24-7. The product is hazardous to handle, and, and uh, mishaps can be catastrophic. And so change happens very slowly. And, and, you know, as a society, should be grateful for that, frankly. We oh, absolutely. We don't yeah, want to I, shove fast, unthought through change into plant. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've said for years there's nobody more conservative than the vice president uh, in charge of an oil refinery, and that's a damn good thing. And that's a damn good thing. Quite right. Right. Quite right. So, how, But what we are seeing in oil and gas, uh, so first of all, uh, midstream get the value proposition, right? They, mm -hmm. they have a midstream operations. Uh, there's the, the thing with midstream is that their problem is not just equipment reliability. It is uh, optimization, optimization across the value yep. chain. Quite right. right? Yep, absolutely. And, and, and so the, the fact that the, you know, call it the industrial Internet of Things or the, the use of uh, digital twins allows them to get uh, data that everybody can understand shared across the value chain. And so everybody, whether they're at the, you know, gas gathering system or a gas plant or the product delivery or you know, wherever they happen to be in the business, they can understand the value of their uh, local operation within their area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so midstream, got it. Uh, upstream, one of the things that's happening is that there's been a significant uh, reduction in cost of remote monitoring in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So where in the past people had to send operators out to every well site every day to make sure there was no spill. Yep. The advent of cameras and more uh, cell, uh, better cell coverage and all that kind of stuff is driving down the cost of remote monitoring and thus reducing the amount of time that your operators have to spend driving and increasing their availability to do things like make sure the wells are actually operated properly. Yeah, yeah major, so, major win for the industry, and it's one of the reasons oh, yeah. why the cost, uh, what, what, what you, with the price having dropped as much as it has, it, it does raise the question, well, how, how is it that production continues to go up? 
as well because the the inefficiencies of the the legacy model tolerated in times of high prices have now been squeezed out and absolutely uh, and little stuff like that quite right absolutely yeah so during the during the boom you're building as fast as you can during the first part of the downturn you cut as fast as you can but then at some point you actually have, have to, to make change improve yeah. operations yeah, you got to make change yeah exactly right so right. starts of lots of uh, so, so so sounds like there's still plenty of potential here and we're only really getting going on the world of the internet of things forecasters okay. propose to that uh, the uh, uh, industrial landscape will add billions and billions of sensors between now and 2030 and oh, yeah. uh, can absolutely see that as a uh, uh, as a uh, as a trajectory will drive demand for uh, solutions that try to uh, handle the integration dimension so puts puts your puts you in a good spot i think any well that's why we went here yeah, yeah. Um, see the hole in the market it, yeah go fill it exactly yeah. Exactly. We see a hole and we go fill it. So it's been it's been really exciting. And we see 2020 uh, being very exciting uh, as more companies get to the point where they realize that there's actually practical, meaningful things that they can do in the short term to improve business decision making and drive down costs. Yeah. I mean, the, the big companies have done a great job of selling this vision of you know, making better decisions through machine learning and artificial intelligence and digital transformation. But ultimately, someone's got to go, well, what does that mean to me in my job? today at a, at a facility uh, yeah yeah right we're, we're and that's around. kind of the level we're trying to work at is this sort of okay let's let's bring some of these dreams down to pragmatic incremental steps that allow you to you know work your way forward yeah uh, and just like organizing the data and getting it in front of people who can act on it is uh, it, it delivers huge value. You know, you, you may eventually find out that machine learning is actually not where the money is. That the money is actually in, you know, stopping operating the way you did and operating in a different way. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure others who will listen to this podcast day will 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 be quite inspired to say, hey, the there's there's still plenty of landscape in the the gaps between the you know the the uh, large companies like the microsofts the hitachis the siemens and and process control people and right. uh, and and that infrastructure and architecture is not 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 yet fully baked so there's plenty of space yet out there any advice that you could share with other entrepreneurs out there about what you've what you've seen that drives success for you well, there's a few. One is don't try to do everything yourself. <laughs> um, yep. you, you have to understand what you are uniquely good at and focus on that and build relationships with other companies that have complementary strengths. Yeah. So you know, for us, we looked at Microsoft and there's a hole in their platform. Great. So we put a lot of effort into the, Microsoft, the relationship with Microsoft, and it takes a lot of effort. But another thing is, like, when you look at our bench strength within Shook IoT, there's three people with PhDs in chemical engineering, process control, what would now be called data science here in this company. And yet we don't really consider ourselves a data science company or a you know, big data statistics, we do it, but we are not uniquely good at, you know, understanding how rod pumps work or uh, compressor performance or compressor fault detection or anything like that. Hmm. So we, we expect to work with subject matter experts in both methodologies like you know, machine learning and AI and specific domains like uh, rod pumps uh, in order to deliver value to our customers. Exactly. Uh, so that's like understand, understand what you're good at, put lots of effort into the ecosystem and understanding where you sit at the, in the ecosystem. Um, those are really the important pieces of advice. Yeah. 
This has been a great, Dave. Thanks very much for taking the time to share the Shook IoT story with me today. And and uh, I'm sure you and I will cross paths as we typically do at the various yeah. conferences uh, taking place in oil and gas. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, good fun. Thank you. And uh, okay. those of us listening to Digital Oil and Gas, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, look for a, another episode on uh, the uh, digital oil topics uh, sometime in the next week or two. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.